Hi, I'm Kristen Griego, and recently I asked people online if they would be interested in knowing how I think about mouthpieces start to finish when I'm designing. And it was an overwhelming yes, and I was taken back by um, everybody wanting to hear this information. So I thought I'd record this and get it out before the weekend, and I've got to go to Boston, and then we've got trips coming up, and get this to you. So I recently had to design a mouthpiece. It was a tenor mouthpiece. And it's a, it's a design that's going to be played by a lot of people um, younger from high school through college. And I had to think about how I should approach this. And of course, I, I've, I've listened to thousands of players and the commonalities that I get from listening to them is important. It gives me information and tells me, I think, what I need to know. More times than not, somebody's playing too deep of a mouthpiece and not necessarily too big, but too deep. And then the pitch will sag in the upper register. The, 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 the timbre will actually shift down and we'll start roll, wanting to roll flat. And especially on tenor, if you can't play a D scale two octaves, then something's wrong. It needs to be dead nuts in the center, two octaves. And that high D, because it's a terrible partial um, above, and we actually voice, in, I, I, I always try and voice a tenor to have the bolero B flat a little sharp so that the D above it is in tune. Now when it comes to in, uh, mouthpieces, I want, when, when it comes to playing, it needs to be as easy to do this two octave D scale as possible. But I also think that many players too, at too young of an age go too big and then they get too uh, developed inside or like a, a stiff muscle uh, or flexed muscle, they won't get a resonant sound, a clear resonant sound. So my goal in, in making mouthpieces is to get the tissue inside the mouthpiece to be more pliable uh, and resonant. Uh, so that the upper register is the same width. Recently, I think it was three days ago, we had a jazz player in, and he was playing octaves, 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 octaves. And every time he went to the upper octave, it was half the size. Reason? He had half the tissue resonating in the upper octave because he was having to muscle it to be able to do, do it. And he was a talented player, was able to do it. But I started working with him and adjusting the volume without telling him what was happening. And then when we got it correctly, the, the, vol the octaves would stay the same size and the same resonance. And that's important to me, to be able to have a person not always working. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. If you, if you have the ability to stay relaxed and resonant, then you can bring the sound in when you want. And you can also relax and bring the sound warmer. But if, if it doesn't stay right down the middle, you don't really stand a chance at deviating and making more musical choices. So on this mouthpiece I was working on, it's gonna be an ES5. Oh, I already make a custom series, CS5 for Getson, that goes out with all their custom series horns. And we wanted to make an ES5. And I, I knew that I wanted to be in the ballpark of a five where somebody that was coming off a six and a half or a seven could play, but someone coming off of a four could also come the other way. So I have a, a rim that's more rounded and a little more nebulous on the inner bite um, so that it doesn't just lock them in in one place. When I work with a professional player, it's a different story. I'm working for that one individual player, which is their needs and their haul. And that, that's, it's, it's a very singular approach. With this, on a rim that multiple pe people across the world can play, whether it be um, in Aosta, or all, uh, Japan, and Tokyo, or um, Taiwan, anywhere in the world. They have to be able to play this. And so I want a rim that's comfortable um, and not sharp in any way, shape, or form. I, I don't believe that having, and you can disagree, disagree with me in the comments, it'll be fun to read. I don't believe that uh, um, a sharp inner rim is needed to have a good, clean, clear attack. Um, I do believe that a well-balanced mouthpiece when you air start, will go will develop very quickly. So when you go ha ha ha, if it's well, if it's the right compression, it's going to develop into a, a, the body of the note more quickly. And if that happens, then you won't need a lot of articulation to clean it up and add the to it. So that's my own personal belief structure. You don't have to buy into it. Feel free to argue with me. It'll be fun. <laughs> no, I agree to disagree. No, really, it, it'll be fun. So anyway. Uh, I, I really want to add the compression in the cup 
and then the blow and the, the freeness and, the, and that comes from the throat and the back bore. So I didn't go, I went with a medium deep cup here uh, so that we can achieve a richness in sound, but not so rolled to the fundamental with a very deep cup that the upper register starts to sag and you don't get that compression. If, you, if it gets over compressed and the first mouthpiece, I, I had these parameters. I wanna make this out of inch and 9 16 bar stock, not inch and 5 8 why? Because less scrap. I want less scrap in this mouthpiece. It's also gonna be a little shorter. I had these parameters, why? Because if it's a little shorter here in overall length, then I can have a shorter throat and I can do a little smaller throat. Um, if it was longer and had a, a longer throat that was smaller, it's gonna over compress and really back up on you. The throat length really matters to the freeness of the air or, or not. And how do I know this? Well, I, I messed up. I made my first one, I wanted the 277 throat. So I made it, got it from playing it, and I was like, oh, it really, I could feel it backing up into my throat. Tension, not good. So I decided, well, I'm going to open the backboard. It's got to be in the backboard, right? So I, got, I have a hand reamer that I can use to just spot check. So I start reaming out the backboard, but that tension in my throat and in my body was still there. So it's not in the backboard. The throat, I went too small. With It was out of balance with the cup depth at that point. So I made a call um, and we made one at 279, just up two thousandths but kept the same throat length and kept the same, uh, I went back to the original back bore. And sure enough, it moved from here and this uh, tension feeling in my body um, to being right at the face. Now, if it goes the other way, it'll, the response will start being, instead of just ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, right here, it'll start going fa, fa, fa. And I hear that a lot of time and it's because it's taking too long to compress or there's not enough uh, compression in the mouthpiece to achieve it being right here. So 279, I hit a window that I was happy with. And then I started balancing the back bore and the color of sound. And I start doing that with the engagement on, on some of these mouthpieces, there's, there's, I've almost ripped them off now, there's markings of how deep I'm going into the uh, lead pipe. And it's really important, the farther in you go, the more, the wider the sound. Farther out you go, uh, the, the more focused the sound. And so I'm, I'm balancing width of sound and depth of sound. Depth of sound is established more at the cup um, and the cup shape, which is what I call north-south, east-west. Width of sound, I can adjust with internal backboard volume, length of throat as well, because if the backboard gets bigger, you're gonna have a shorter throat and you're gonna have a larger uh, flow within the backboard. Um, but if the throat's bad, like I said earlier, you got one choke point. You got to get past that one before you can get to the flow. So then I balance the engagement. And then when I, when I, and I'll, I'll test this mouthpiece with um, Shire's lead pipes, which go in usually inch and eighth or deeper. Uh, Yamaha is the same with a lot of their designs. So I'll, I'll grab my Yamaha, my Shire's lead pipes that I keep in my desk and I'll test um, on those. And then I'll also test on uh, some cons, some gets in 40 and 41, 40 cents, which I love. Um, I have my traditional uh, Edwards Thayer, which I had since 1995, and I'll play it on that and see how it is. But I also have to remember, I'm designing this for the new 1047FN for Getzen, okay? And this instrument is gonna be the, the old 1047 bell section with a new tuning, tuning slide um, and with a new hand slide with a, uh, interchangeable lead pipes. So then I have to test on that because the primary instrument that I'm designing this for is the 1047FN. And it has to obviously play lights out on that. But I also look at how it responds to the overtone series with other lead pipes. Because somebody else is going to buy a 10, somebody's going to buy a 1047 and then give this mouthpiece to a friend because they have their own uh, belief structure and they love uh, their mouthpiece, their original one, so which is fine. But I need to make sure that this mouthpiece plays well across the spectrum, not just on the instrument that I'm working for. But I also think it's important for you to know what the designers are thinking and know why we're doing what we're doing. Um, for instance, this little scallop right here, uh, this is the custom series blank that I started with. And then I did a little scallop here and that's a tribute to the Getzen um, uh, power bore rings that we're doing now on the 40 and 41, 47 that have a little scallop on them. And so I want these little subtleties to be there. Um, I've also went to a real liquid shape here um, so that it's, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I like it, um, especially when it's in the instrument and it's engraved, it looks stunning. but. The key thing is when I'm machining it, we do a face 
and then one tool can do this entire outside profile. On some of my other mouthpieces that I've designed, I have right hand, left hand, and a neutral tool to do all the decorative, sharp, crisp details. And with this, I can use one tool. What does that mean? About four to six seconds every time the, in, the, the turret indexes and goes to that tool. So I'm saving probably 30 to 40 seconds by not having to go to these other two or three tools. I can do this complete in one path. And that, that will save some time and we'll be able to keep up because the, the, the 1047 FN, if we sell um, quite a few of these, I'm going to need to be able to keep up. And it's by these production decisions that I'm able to then know that we'll save seconds, which time is money, especially with the CNC machine, that we're going to be able to keep up. Not going to inch and five eighths, um, which I do on some other larger OD mouthpieces. I go to inch and nine sixteenths. There's less roughing to get down to this final shape. So these are conscious decisions that I make um, that will then, we have less scrap, uh, less recycling. It all, it all comes into, in, into the, the equation here. So um, that's why I chose this shape, not having the real sharp detail. I can save some time on the machine there. Um, now response. Response when it's right and it's lightning fast, um, dun, da -da 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 -da, it's gonna be simple because it, the compression is set and when you air start, ha, 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 it's developing quick. So then when, when you just add the button and you just add a touch of an articulation, you, you can be fine. I, I find, especially in America, so many people over articulate. And the reason you over articulate is because, ha, uh, if you were to air start, just a um, uh, C scale or a B flat scale, B flat's fine. Um, ha, 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 you'll find ha, uh, ha, uh, a lot of times. And so Americans, They'll build up, they'll over compress and they'll over articulate and then they release the compression and, and then you'll kind of get an explosion. You can get a little fracture. I find that when you do the opposite and you get the compression just right, it can just be a clean button and it's a beautiful sound it's, and you don't get a fracture or um, a fracture with, with it, which is the, the lips um, buzzing at different frequencies even coming in there. So there's all these things that I, I consider and it's, it's really over the last 26 years of working with people um, and seeing, and I, I want for a high school collegiate player to be able to play a D scale two octaves and have that upper octave be the same width as the bottom octave. For me, it wasn't. As I would ascend, it would always shrink in volume because I was always playing too big of a cup volume and or throat backboard. It was mismatched and I didn't know. I just, it was what everyone was playing around me and so I just chose these. I think you deserve to know what is possible when you find the right compression rate for you so it's right here, not backed up into your throat and not too far in. So not uncomfortable. The second I feel any tension come into my upper chest cavity here, through here, this has nothing to do with trombone. We should just be releasing air and going. So I hope this makes sense. Um, I actually have Jesse here and uh, to help me along. I, I think I've covered a lot of everything. Is there anything else that you think um, we need to cover on this subject? Um. I don't believe so. Um, I did have a one question for you. Yeah. Um, so when you tried it on your Thayer, um, you had this mouthpiece designed um, to be for the 1047 FN. Mm -hmm. What was your experience like on the Thayer? It was interesting because I was, I was playing it and I was really diving into um, it and comparing it to some other pieces. And I've had that horn since 1995. And as I got into it, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm now designing around a Thayer horn when the instrument it's supposed to be on is a rotor horn. And so I actually, it, it played great. And actually it was, it was, it was free. Um, and I was able to play, you heard, down to pedal F all the way up. And I was able to even do, I start on, uh, I do a chromatic exercise where I'll start on bolero B flat. And then I'll work my way up until it's high E flat. And I was able to get to high E flat, just keeping my air steady. And it would still, it wouldn't back up on me and it was still the correct shape. Um, and that's about all you'll get from me. You won't get an E or an F, sorry. I'm not, I'm not that guy. But, um, but when I switched to the rotors, I, I quickly was like, oh, that's right. And I made sure that it was, it was good on the other lead pipes and on the Thayer horn. But when I went to the rotor horns, which is what this is intended use is for, um, it's gonna be ES5 for the Eterna series um, with the Getzen instruments. And I'm excited to get it out and let people try it and see what you think after you've, you've heard me talk about this um, with the engagement. And it was interesting. 
when I got to, when I went from the Thayer to the Rotor, there was one little aspect of sparkle, and I think you heard, um, and I, I, I really loved it on Friday. I loved the response, but I came in on Saturday and I recorded myself, and I was unhappy with the sound on the other side of the bell. The resonance on this side was still great, but I beat myself up on Friday, and so I took a break, took Sunday off, came back in on Monday, and actually, it was fine. I recorded myself again, and it was, it was a me issue, not a mouthpiece issue. Imagine that. And... I was able to then do a very small um, deburring technique right on the very end of the mouthpiece and the, there was a high uh, frequency that was able to come in then. The air was able to just travel a little faster and so we added that into the production techniques and now there's a, just a beautiful sparkle on the outside that carries through. We don't get that um, tension in the sound which I, I always talk about, which is like, I think three to 40, 200 uh, K uh, in, in the frequency. If you start getting it, it's, it's like compressed or too much aperture noise. What I try and do is get the body of the note to travel at the same rate as the aperture noise. And then you can mask the, or even the physical buzz that's happening. You want to mask that in the color of the sound. If that doesn't happen, that will travel at a faster rate than the rest of the overtones and they will be perceived as this. It's kind of just a little um, aggressive. And so you have to be real careful. Listen to your sound. You want to try and mask that aperture noise and, and hide it in the color of the, the north, south, and east, west. And then um, and having plenty of depth and not that tension in, this, in the core of sound. So I hope this makes sense. There's a lot to unpack. Um, is there anything else we should cover? Um, kind of on that same note, so um, on that Friday when we were uh, messing around with the mouthpieces, yeah. um, I know you specifically were playing quite a bit that day. Mm -hmm. So you started again on Saturday, but then kind of realized, oh, I might be a little tired. Do you think people out um, you know, in the market for a new mouthpiece, do you think they may go to a shop and just play for six hours straight and then you know, settle on a mouthpiece? Do you think that... Might happen. If you make the decision, and I've often questioned this whenever I'm working with somebody, I try and move as quickly at the front end and then make sure it's still working when the face is swollen. Because at the end of the an hour and a half concert, how is your face going to feel? So you have to be careful. It has to work in the beginning when you're cold, medium, all the way, and when you're warm, and when you have a lot of blood flow to these small muscles, it has to work then as well. Because you don't want to make a decision and then as your face swells, then it feels really cramped and you, you start really fighting the mouthpiece. It has to work under all, all conditions. And I, I find that the, if you can have the compression right here, then you don't have to press as much or use as much pressure, which then the increased blood flow, increased endurance because you're able to dispel the lactate, a lactate acid from the small muscles. And that's what it's all about. It's about recovery. Active recovery is what I always like to think of it as. You're, you're under the gun, you're playing, and you're building up some lactate acid, but you get a couple re uh, measures rest as you pull down if you're able to flush the lactic acid very quickly because you're, the muscles aren't over, you know, they're not fatigued to that point yet. Um, if, as long as you can always expel lactate acid faster then you're producing lactate acid, you should be in a good shape and your endurance should be fine. You get into trouble when you're creating more lactate acid than your body can buffer and get out of the muscles. That's a different subject and I'm sorry to, to go that deep, but um, th these are things I think about. Um, as an athlete, an endurance, I've always been an endurance athlete, but riding bikes or running or jogging. I'm not jogging so much anymore, but I do ride my bike and um, cross country ski and, and you, you have to approach the instrument. I think if you've chosen to play, be a brass player, you've chosen to be an athlete and you have to be mindful of these very small muscles. So I, I think that answers the question and then some of you. So I hope you guys have a great weekend and I look forward to seeing you around. Take care.